Good afternoon, fellow space travellers. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about uh, change, how art and science gets involved in change. Um, and they're really the two concepts, there's a, a sister concept of change and that's rate of change. And it's often ignored and I'm going to try and make the case that once we start drilling down on rate of change, we might actually, and artists and scientists might actually build a bridge. Um, so the universal constant, there's a slight sciencey joke to that, but I, won't, I don't have time to explain it, is change. Um, and I just wanted to point out what some painters on canvas have done in different rates of change. So Mona Lisa da Vinci's painting, uh, how long do you think she held that beautiful, mysterious gaze? And um, then we have Arthur Streeton, uh, that particular painting I enjoyed enormously when there was an exhibition at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. It's called Sunshine. How long do you think the sun was shining? So, um, and then Renoir, the boating party. It's just kept that idea of photograph has been taken and there is change. Somebody, you know, moved up to say something to somebody else and then somebody moved off. Um, and then finally, uh, Boccioni is an Italian artist who went into dynamism and he wanted to show change on a two-dimensional canvas. And my point is that everybody is trying to show some sort of change and it might be slow and it might be fast and that's the rate of change. So there's this suggestion of a before and after in that two-dimensional painting. Um, there's a superposition of sequences of events which is Boccioni. Uh, cinema of course is a form of art and we call them colloquially movies. They move, you know. Um, and of course there's video art and uh, Bill Viola is somebody whom I enjoy enormously. Uh, you may know of him, uh, but there are others as well. Uh, any of you went to the National Gallery in Canberra, there was this wonderful kinetic sculpture with this big mouth that go around and kind of you had a feeling you were going to be eaten by this. Um, and then of course there's performance art and various other things, all depicting change. Um, so what can science take from art and what can art take from science? Let's sort of put that into the weather climate arena, which you know is appropriate for SiteWorks 2022. Uh, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. That's a little joke amongst meteorologists and climatologists. Or climate's your personality and weather is your mood. Just think about that. So what's happening recently is that uh, weather is sort of has a Mr. Hyde, you know, Dr. Jekyll is like the one in 100 event and Mr. Hyde is the one in 10 event of flooding. So we have something going on with our weather, which is probably coming from our climate. We know we get change in weather. Have you called your mum the other day and said, what's the weather like, you know, where you are? It's not just a filler. It's something to give you some idea of change but climate can change as well and we're finding out about that. So this is an indication of change and in fact climate change because it's average temperature in, on the globe over each year since 1850. And you'll see somewhat, some, some stability until you, you get into the 1930s, 1940s, things go up but they come down again. They go up, they come down again, but they end up going up. And what a scientist does, a statistician like me, is you end up starting to think about interpolating this. And by the time you're hitting about 2020 and you look at what was like in about 1960, change would be the temperature here minus the temperature here. That would be change, right? And that would change would be positive temperatures going up. What we do in statistics, we sometimes put a moving average over that. So every 10 years we take an average. What that does is smooths out the oscillations, the blue dots, and we end up with that smooth red line. Okay, so this is, there's two formulas in this talk. This is one of them. And I know you can handle it. <laughs> um, so pick a time, and I'm picking 1990. And then pick this thing which I've called time lag. And the Greeks uh, have this uh, letter in their alphabet called delta. And delta is often used to indicate a time lag or a time change. 
So we're going to call delta 30 years, a bit like I did with the graph. Climate change would be the climate in 1990 minus the climate in 1960, which would be 1990 minus that time lag of 30 years. That's not hard. You've all got an A already, see? Um, the definition of climate change, though, I want to make clear, depends on T and it depends on delta. And that's what we often miss. My little joke about 1 in 100 versus 1 in 10 when it comes to floods. We seem to be seeing 1 in 10 floods, don't we? What's happening is that climate is changing at a faster rate and that's determined by delta. And people often forget this time lag. Okay, we'll get back to that because there's a second formula. I know you're going to do well on that as well. Um, look, this is Australia. What I thought I'd do is you can go global and say, oh, that's our planet. You know, things are getting hot on the planet. But we can ask if things are getting hot in Australia. Um, there's no moving average through this particular graph. But what you see in the brown or orange is the land temperature. And what you see since 1910, we've only been having uh, decent records, like countrywide records. Like with Sydney's been going on since 1850. But in terms of computing Australia's temperature, and you can do that, there are statistical ways to do that, 1910 is as far back as we can go. And what you can see, there's a, an arbitrary zero line drawn here so we don't get too, so we look at anom what's called anomalies. But anyhow, what you see here is temperature kind of staying steady and then bingo around 1950, 1960, just like we did for the global thing, up she goes. And people have been also taking the temperature of the ocean. Um, but the, the signal is clear, isn't it? It just keeps coming at you. Uh, since about 1950, 60, things are starting to go up in terms of heat. Um, I like this particular graph, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it because I haven't got a lot of time. But what this particular graph did is it took a, a particular part of the Mediterranean Sea called the Balearic Sea, and it took the temperature of the sea on a daily basis. And then it did it for the last 40 years. So it plotted what the temperature did in 1960, and then it plotted what the temperature did in 1970, uh, 61, and then it plotted the temperature in 1962. So you see all these grey lines here, and they're all indicating roughly what the temperature is doing in the last 30 years. And then they said, let's look at what happened in 19, uh, sorry, 2022. And you can see that that is really almost off the charts. So something, so this is a bit different, isn't it? The way we're expressing climate change. We're comparing the days of this period between May and August. We're comparing the days and see how they did. And that gets at the notion of a one in 10, one in 100, that type of thing. So these are all different ways that we might express climate change. And extremes, the one I just showed you, are really what's coming at us when it comes to climate change. Yes, things will change. A universal constant is change. But is that change too much? Is it extreme? And what we're seeing, of course, is droughts, wildfires, floods, tornadoes, and we're seeing more of them and we're seeing them more often. Um, let me now move to ice. So ice in the Arctic is essential for a lot of um, uh, well, certainly for polar bears, but also essential for uh, the planet. Uh, think about it as our refrigerator or our air conditioner. It's cooling us, not only in the North Pole where we have the Arctic, but in the South Pole as well. And I'll mention uh, a little bit how those two are connected. So this is a picture of um, way off the coast of Finland, and it's showing the ice breaking up. Now, I've written papers on the ice and, and I'm going to show you something in a minute. But that image is meant to show that we don't have an ice sheet anymore, that we have little pieces of ice that polar bears are trying to live on and uh, unsuccessfully. So this is, this is my particular uh, graph. And what I did is looked at the area of the ice in the Arctic. Okay, you got with me. So the area sort of trundling along and then about 1995 
things are starting to heat up and then the ice, the area of the ice starts to plunge and almost off a cliff. The latest data shows that its trend continues to be downward. Um, and because I'm a, an environmental statistician, I don't just care what's happening at a particular time, I'm interested in where it's happening as well. So what we've done is we've done maps of the ice sheet. Uh, I don't know if you can recognise that, but that's Greenland. Um, this is Europe and Norway. Um, this is Russia and this is uh, America, right? And I think that's Alaska. So, you know, it's the Arctic. There's no land, obviously, at the North Pole. There's just water. So what's happening, actually, is that ice is melting and we've got an idea of this contraction and further contraction and here we are at 2020. Signals are coming through strong, not only in the terms of this temporal downward trend, but also in terms of spatially. This is, this is ours, right? This is the Australian... Um, we have a big piece of this Antarctic Territory. This is Antarctica. I'm involved in an Australian Research Council um, project, a big $40 million project, um, looking at securing Antarctica's environmental future. And this represents the ice sheet around Antarctica and that blob is the blob of land with glaciers and ice um, uh, streams as well coming off it. But what's curious, um, and it gives you an idea of our planet and how incredibly wonderful it is and how interconnected it is, that as that ice melts from the North Pole, it becomes dense and descends. And then there's a conveyor belt that takes that cool water down, depending on your point of view, to the Antarctic and then comes up and causes all sorts of changes in climate in our hemisphere. So Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere through their poles are very much, it's called teleconnected, that's the name for it. Like we think of telephone, you know, television, and then this teleconnection between the North Pole and the South Pole. All right, so what if we lose a few critters? What's that to me? Well, uh, Homo sapiens, that's us, you, me, everyone here, watch out. This is a nice cartoon with um, that rope tied very definitely around his neck. Um, so we, we live on this wonderful planet, planet. We're fellow space travellers, we're moving through space and we have, and there aren't many other planets like ours. Um, a recent one was found and it was only a hundred light years away. I don't know if you're aware, that's, that's a long way away. And it's in that habitable zone where life could be. Um, so we're talking about, uh, well you hear about there's no planet B. Uh, the one that was found is planet E actually and it was found about a week ago. But let's just say it's a hundred light years away and there isn't much closer than that. These are the ecosystems on our planet and these are the ecosystems which are being eroded. Um, and I want to um, sort of bring to you, you've probably heard of it, some of you might, it actually gets to the notion of art and science. There's a hypothesis and it's only a hypothesis called the Gaia hypothesis. Gaia was the Greek goddess of Earth and the Gaia hypothesis is that the biological and non-biological systems are related. And then if there's any change, there's self-regulatory cycles that keep um, the planet within the boundaries of life. And I didn't say which species is going to survive that life. But there's, there's evidence that that Gaia hypothesis is in action. I rather like this one. Uh, I don't know if you remember Pogo, um, but Walt Kelly wrote these really nice cartoons and um, if you've heard the saying that we've met the enemy and he is us, this this cartoon that came out on Earth Day in 1971. Um, look, uh, I'm going to give you a little brief, you know, what about carbon? Carbon is our friend and carbon is our enemy in excess and it's our enemy when it's in the atmospheric pool and it's in the atmosphere. The thing about it is you can't taste it, you can't see it, invisible, it, but it's highly dangerous 
when it gets to high doses. Now you might say, what's a high dose? Well, 400 parts per million? That means of a million molecules in the universe, you only need 400 and you're in trouble. And we are now at 420. And in my work in this area, I've seen it go from 380, about 15 years ago, to 400, past 400, and it's going up to 420, and it's showing no sign of stopping. Um, and it would, the fossil fuel carbon dioxide, the coal-fired power plants, the gas that's fired, um, anything that's not green, you might say, is actually fueling um, these temperature increases that we're seeing because there's a relationship. So you might say, oh, we didn't know about that. Yes, five minutes, thank you. We didn't know about that. Uh, well, uh, a wonderful woman by the name of Eunice Foote wrote something in 1856 that said, yes, we do. And so when did we start measuring it? 1958. What the heck has been going on? When and how long have we been producing carbon dioxide? Since the beginning of the industrial period, 150 years before. So we're in catch up right now. Um, this is John Wolsey, somebody, I'm sure some of you know him. He picked up on that curve, you know, those, uh, that curve there, it's called the Keeling curve. Um, he picked up on it and he made some art around it and I thought it's wonderful because that in essence is the problem that we're facing. That curve is leading to those increases in temperature I showed you earlier. So I believe that art can be a crystal ball, that artists have a great intuition. They feel things that perhaps scientists can't see because they're on the Asperger's you know, <laughs> level there and they can't see it, but give me some data and I can see it, that sort of thing. So um, scientists, uh, artists uh, are really seeing things that we are not. Look, this is our stunning blue marble. We need to look up in 1972. This particular graph uh, using colour, and it says that when, the, um, when we had 320 parts per million, we, our temperatures were blue, and we were at 420 parts per million, our temperatures are red. Get the idea? I mean, there's a very strong visual message there without being too, um, too precise. Uh, this is my satellite. I work on this satellite. I work for NASA. I'm an affiliate. This is the Orbital Carbon Observatory 2 satellite. And these are the data that we collect. These are the data that I analyse. Um, and I'm very interested in looking at rates of change. Now, this is the second formula. The rate of change is climate change. Remember delta? Don't forget delta. That's the velocity. If you think about a rate of change as a velocity, well, I tell you something's changing, all it means is that I came from Wollongong today and I got to Bundanon, or I got to Bundanon. Just that's the difference, right? That's the distance. But what about how long did it take me? How, what velocity was I doing in the car? That's the rate of change. And so um, rate of change is going to actually affect the planet in more ways than we can imagine. Beware large rates of change. So what's happening is, in 1960, the carbon dioxide rate of change was two parts per million per year, per year. Remember I divided by delta? In, 19, in 2015, it was about three parts per million per year and remains that way. So ROC, the rate of change, is going up and temperature is going up as well. Um, this is something which I feel very strongly about. There is going to be inequities coming at us as we get into uh, adaptability, which is ad adaptation, which is something that we're faced with now, um, the need for food, shelter, energy, well-being is going to be disproportionately spread. And I've called this social determinants of adaptability. It was uh, it's stolen a bit from another term called social determinants of health, but it basically means that adaptability should be available to everybody, but there are these social determinants that make it unequal. And I, I do believe, and there's a lot of security people and military and countries that believe that mass migration is coming as people try to look for a place. 
So these are the waves of change facing us, like a good cartoon. There's COVID-19, we always thought it was bad. Recession's coming, it's going to crash on our head. And then finally, climate change is the big green wave. So um, the, the, I, I want to actually make a point that we're in the blink of an eye. In 150, 200 years, is just a geological blink of the eye, and we have done it. Our species has changed this planet in ways that we could not imagine over 400 million years. Um, and will Gaia save us? Will the planet come back and somehow or other get rid of this carbon dioxide? Yes, a couple of hundred, you know, a couple of thousand years, no problem. So the rate of change of carbon dioxide is actually very, is negative, but very small, and it's the silicate weathering of rocks. But what we're doing is putting more fossil fuel into the atmosphere, and that rate of change is huge, and it's swamping any chance that the planet has to save us. We have something called COP, you might have heard of COP21, COP26, that offers us some hope for sure. So um, we're emerging from this Goldilocks era, this kind of nice feeling that we had post-industrial. We thought we could do everything. We thought we were under control. Growth, 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 you know, was all about, and economic growth. Those rates of change are competing with climate rates of change, system, ecosystem rates of change, and species rates of change. Now, I'm going to close. I think I'm maybe 30 seconds over or a minute. This is a little experiment I did. How are we going to communicate this stuff? So um, there's this AI technology, uh, artificial intelligence on crown.com, and I put in some keywords, and I wanted bushfires in the style of Arthur Boyd. <laughs> now, most of you here who work at Bundan on are probably going through uh, you know, some sort of, my God, we lived through it, that sort of thing, you know. Um, but that's what uh, the computer came up with that Arthur Boyd would do. So I did floods, and there we are in a deep valley, and that's Arthur Boyd. And to get you some idea of the style and that sort of thing, I did Arthur Streeton, another Arthur, <laughs> and that's Arthur Streeton's floods. So um, look, with that, uh, that, that may come up. I may play that YouTube if we want, but I do have to finish. I'd just like to thank you for your attention and putting up with uh, a scientist trying to tell you about what it means to be an artist. Thank you. <laughs>